you're ready, feel free to share whatever you've prepared. Sure. Can I just ask you a real quick question? Where are you and what time is it there? So I'm from Singapore and it's 1 a.m. here. That's what I thought. Wow. Okay. I, I take my hats off to you. Um, so hopefully I'll keep everybody awake. How's that? So um, I'm going to start here. Is everybody having it? How's the comp? How are things going? Is everybody having a good morning, noon, night? Yeah, it's really fun. Everyone here is from all around the world. Yeah, that well, that's what I figured. It was international, so it probably didn't matter when you had it. Wasn't going to be a good time for somebody somewhere. Okay, so let me just dive right in. I first, I want to thank Joshna for inviting me. Um, I love the title of your conference, your group, Revolutionized STEM. I just think that's the best. Um, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you. Uh, Joshna co contacted me after hearing me give a similar talk to a group at Lenox Hill Hospital, which is one of the hospitals in the um, hospital system that is associated with the medical school I teach in. And um, so I'm going to talk about medical education and the history of medical education specifically. But what I want to do first is I want to um, give a little bit of a disclaimer in that I am not a, an historian. Um, and uh, I don't come at this as a professional historian. I'm actually trained as a microbiologist. So just keep that in mind. Um, can everybody see the screen OK? Yeah, we can see the screen. You can see the screen. Okay, everybody's good. Okay, because I'm going to make you all disappear so I can see my slides. Okay, so here we go. So let's get started. What are we going to do? So I'm going to talk about the history of medical education. I'm going to focus initially on Europe, but then I'm going to move to the United States for a couple of reasons. One, I just think the history of medical education in the United States is much more dynamic and much more interesting. And I hope I convince you of that. And also because that's the space where I that I inhabit. Um, and so um, just in my journey of sort of learning about medical education um, history over a number of years, it's kind of where my focus has been. Then I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to talk about medical education in the 21st century. And, and this is going to be super relevant for you guys, obviously. Um, but I hope I give you something to think about as if you're planning on applying to medical school someday um, or some point, um, give you something to think about so that it'll make you a better consumer. And what I really want to do is I want to um, I want to spend some time having a discussion and some questions at the end. Okay, so is everybody ready? Here we go. So we're going to start by talking about the two types of doctors that existed in Western civilization, i.e., Europe, um, before 1800. But before we do that, I want you to take a look at this this painting, which is actually somewhat famous and. What it shows is here's our, our physician and um, here's our patient. And the first thing that strikes me about this picture is that notice the dog is actually spending more, focusing more on the patient than the physician. So just, you know, keep that in mind. But, but if you think about where medicine was prior to the 1800s, you know, it, there really hadn't been much uh, in terms of scientific advancement. Um, the four humors were still sort of the basic basis of all physiologic thought. Um, you know, bloodletting was a key cure-all. Um, you know, diagnosis was done by looking at the color of your tongue and the color of your urine. Um, so it was super, super primitive. You know, there were no x-rays, there were no drugs, there, you know, besides herbs, there were no, you know, there, there was no clinical trials. It was, it was very, very, a very subjective um, uh, endeavor. And oftentimes the best physicians, best physicians were those physicians with the best bedside manner, which, you know, maybe this guy's, you know, maybe this woman is actually paying the, the bill. So that's why he's looking at, her, you know, spending so much time looking at her. But in any event, doctors before the 18th, before the 1800s were put into one of two buckets. They were either physicians or they were surgeons. And these were two very different, uh, different professions. So physicians were learned gentlemen. Now, I don't know how learned they all, all were, but they were definitely gentlemen. This was not something that a woman could do. Um, in fact, women who, um, who, who oftentimes had much more knowledge of how herbs could be used medicinally were oftentimes 
um, considered witches or sorceresses or some kind of have magical powers. Um, there was no practical training to become a physician, to become a learned gentleman. Um, the only thing you had to learn was how to mix the various herbs together to make whatever cocktail of, 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 of remedy um, that a given um, imbalance of the humor dictated. Um, th there were universities that provided lecture series, but there was nothing that was recognizable as a, a coherent program where you started here and you ended here and you graduated and you got a diploma that said you're, you're now a physician. There was no specific schedule. There was no kind of assessment of proficiency. There was no graduation. It was just, you know, you went to these lectures, you met um, other other people in the in the lectures, you hobnobbed with the professors and so on. And at some point you decided, okay, you know, I, I can be a physician now. I, I, I've learned enough. So what was interesting is that there's throughout much of medical education in Europe, there were no exams. And I think this is really important. I think this is really interesting to you as students, and it's kind of interesting to me as a professor, because the reason there were no exams was professors were held on such a high pedestal. And I think they thought of themselves with such great esteem that it was almost crass to suggest that they should be giving exams. Like, why wouldn't you have known? Why wouldn't you know what I'm trying to teach you? Um, so it was contrary to the ideals of learning and the role of, of the, the esteemed professor. So uh, obviously that died at some point because I know you're all stressed out by exams. All right, so the other type of doctor was a surgeon and surgeon was a kind of catch all term for barbers, for these people, these men who went from town to town and sort of offered their services. You, if you need a wart removed or a you know, tooth extracted or a, you know, whatever your surgical problem was, they would come and do it for you. Ship, ship's surgeon, so every surgeon had, every ship had to have a surgeon because accidents happened on ships. And if you've ever seen the movie Master and Commander, that's a great, great movie, great example of a ship's surgeon. Um, and then battlefield surgeons. So being a battlefield surgeon was a, it was a great gig. There are lots of battles. Uh, and uh, you were really an amputation specialist. So here's a, a picture that is uh, showing a, a, a battlefield surgeon doing uh, uh, amputation right in the field. Because remember, there was no germ theory of disease. That didn't happen until the mid 1860s, early 1870s. So the idea that you would have to get a patient to a sterile environment and do this under controlled uh, situation was completely alien to the way they were thinking. Now, contrary to the learned gentleman who did nothing practical to become a physician other than uh, learn how to mix up some herbs and spices, to become, um, to become a surgeon, you followed an apprenticeship model. Now, apprenticeships we think of now for craftspeople or electricians. Um, that also sort of tells you you know, being a surgeon was like being a crafts, it was, it was a trade. It wasn't a profession per se. So how did that work? Well, you started really young. So let's say, you know, you're a 13 year old boy and your, you know, surgery is your family, uh, family trade or uh, your parents arrange for you to go to the next county over and train as an apprentice uh, with a surgeon. And so at age 13, you can imagine you're doing all the grunt work and you gradually get a, a more and more responsibility. And about five or seven years later, you are done. You're done. Hooray, you're a surgeon. You can hang up a shingle. You can become a, a ship surgeon. You can go into battle. You can do whatever you want. You, you're done. However, if you want to become, you know, if you want to charge higher prices, if you want to become sort of the elite amongst your craft, you could uh, become a journeyman. And this is basically like a second round of apprenticeship, but where you're uh, under someone who is a master, who belongs, who's at the highest level of his, his always his profession as a surgeon, and you're, uh, you're, you're working under that person. So a journeyman uh, would usually do this second round of apprenticeship for about seven years. And then if he uh, had enough money and knew the right people, he could join the Surgeon's Guild. 
And so you can see that's a big difference between this kind of surgery and here we have our, our, our dudes with their hats and their frills and all looking very clean and not particularly unsavory as shown or, you know, in, in this sort of uh, work a day type of surgeon. But the bottom line is that medical education was an either or. You were either book scholar or you were, you learned it was on the job training, one or the other. So, you know, here we have this, this, this pendulum, you know, you have book learning or do we do on the job training? How is this going to, to settle out? And what I'm gonna do is transition into slightly more recent, so 19th and early 20th century medical education, We'll continue a little bit in Europe and then we're really going to shift gears to the US. So medical education in Europe in the early 19th and 20th century went underwent a big transformation. First of all, thanks to the Spanish, not the Spanish, excuse me, the French Revolution, where the the concepts of egalité, fraternité, and liberté were espoused, um, guilds uh, were eliminated throughout Europe. So egalité, uh, fraternité doesn't really play into the notion that you got to know the right person and fork over a whole boatload of money to be the considered the, the highest in your profession. It was felt that it should be more meritocratous. So surgeon, surgeons guilds were eliminated. Um, but the idea that there was a difference between a surgeon and a, and a physician, you know, sort of stuck. Um, but so what happened was all doctors, um, including now, you know, surgeons, uh, increased the amount of, of book learning. So they would go to lectures, they would hobnob in their clubs. Um, there was still very little in the way of practical training um, as we progressed through the uh, 19th century. Most of the practical training was done on cadavers. So uh, it wasn't like what you would think of like a clerkship or an internship now. Um, and importantly, graduation was optional. Like you, you didn't have to graduate. You went to these lectures, you, you, know, you, you, you sort of went through the motions and when you felt you were ready to take the training wheels off the bike and, and, and do this on your own and hang up your shingle, um, off you went. So the, one of the most, so that's not to say that, you know, I, I touched a little bit about how the uh, physicians in training would work with cadavers. And in fact, even when they began practicing, um, this is the Charité Hospital in Berlin, which is a really super famous hospital because it's where Koch, Robert Koch worked um, and he had a lab and that's where he developed the germ theory of disease and the Koch postulates is also where von Bering, um, the guy who developed um, antitoxin for diphtheria worked. And that's a whole separate story because Von Bering worked in Koch's lab and then Von Bering won the Nobel Prize before Koch and you know that didn't go over so well. And so, so it was a lot of drama, but that's a whole different story. So, you know, oftentimes the way the way these physicians were were um, were trained would be like they'd be they would literally be doing autopsies in the morning and they would kind of wipe their hands on their on their uh, aprons and then they would go see patients and much of the patient actual patient care as it still is today was delivered by by nurses and by midwives so uh, that's a whole you know we can talk about that later if you want it's, uh, it's interesting how that all worked so anyway let's let's sail across the ocean and we wind up in Philadelphia, eight, uh, 1750. So this is before the revolution. And uh, two physicians who were trained in England go to Benjamin Franklin and say, we wanna start a medical college. Well, the idea of a medical college, there was a few, there was, there was uh, Northern Italy had some medical colleges, the Netherlands had some medical colleges, but it wasn't really, as I, you know, as I described, that wasn't the, the, the main event in terms of medical education in Europe. But they're going to say, okay, they're saying, you know, we have, we're gonna start a medical college here in Philadelphia. And, and so Franklin raises the money and they put together this, you know, something that actually looks like a medical degree where you get a bachelor's degree in medicine. It's a year of lecture and a, a year of apprenticeship. Um, it covers some, some, you know, anatomy, chemistry, materia medica is Latin for, apothecary, you know, uh, drugs. Um, importantly, 
Latin was big. Like you really, when you took your public exam, um, it was either in Latin or you had to otherwise show proficiency in Latin, which is again, thinking about where medicine was at the time, I'm not really sure how relevant it is to be proficient in a dead language um, to, to treat somebody's appendicitis, but you know, whatever. Um, and they also were um, offered a doctor of medicine, which was basically if you had done this um, and you were a little bit older, um, you would do a thesis project and then defend that publicly. So again, graduation wasn't required, but at least it was a nice model and it was a really, really promising start. So, so you know, here we are, this young, this young colony, we're, we're getting our act together, but then this happens and things sort of spin out of control. Some of the people in this College of Philadelphia are, are pro, um, pro royalty. Some of them are pro, you know, pro, uh, uh, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, pro, um, not colonial, whatever, uh, independence. And so the whole thing sort of falls apart. Uh, the, all the independent guys go to Boston and the, the guys who root for King George stay in Philadelphia, the, it's a mess. So medical education stalls out. So where, are, where do we land after the revolution? Well, the Medical College of Philadelphia reconstitutes itself. It goes through a few bumpy years, but you know, about by about ten years after the revolution, uh, you know, we're, we've got things down. And um, what's really funny is remember how we, you know, I, I talked about how no exams because you know I'm I'm a professor and therefore I'm you know a master educator and what comes out of it's from my mouth to your brain and it gets implanted there. Oh no. Here, every student has to take every course twice in order to get credit because it was felt that they wouldn't remember it after the, if they only heard it once. Initially, it was five months of lectures. By the 1860s, it was a full year of didactics. Uh, there was a lot of quote unquote clinical experience, but it was mostly observational. So this is a very famous painting by Thomas Eakins that still hangs in the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and, and these amphitheaters held up to 600 men. Um, and you can imagine, um, they, you know, there were no big TV screens. So if you're up there in the, in the rafters, you know, um, I'm not sure how much of what's going on down here in the galley you're gonna actually see, but you know, it, they tried. So again, this was a reasonable model for others to expand. So actually uh, Harvard started to copy Yale started to copy, and yeah, there we go, not again. Okay, so then we have the, the Civil War and everybody goes and picks a side and has to serve on their side. Uh, the Civil War is the war that the most Americans died in, about 500,000 Americans died, mostly of infectious disease, mostly of gangrene, um, but nonetheless, uh, medical education stalls out once again. So here we go, post-Civil War. So now, you know, think about 1770, excuse me, 1875 or so. Uh, we have, we've blossomed, and <laughs> we've, we've grown from a, a handful of university affiliated programs to over 400 medical education programs of varying size and quality. Most of them were not university affiliated. Most of them were for for-profit apprenticeships. So this was also happening in Europe at the time. So I'm, a, you know, I'm a guy, so I'm a physician, and I have some other guy physicians, and we get together and we decide that we could really actually, uh, you know, use a little extra income. So we're going to start a medical school, and what we're going to do is we're going to either provide lectures ourselves or we're going to hitch ourselves to the, the local university that may be providing lectures. Um, and But we're going to let um, these apprentices pay to follow us around on, on our duties and between, so, so the sort of innovative piece that, that broke away from what was happening in Europe was that although these were for-profit apprenticeships, um, they blended both didactic 
you know, learning where you, you, re you did have to learn anatomy, you did have to learn what little was known of physiology with the practical skill of being a, a physician. Most of these programs were about two years um, long. There, was no, there were no exams. Um, graduation wasn't necessarily required. It certainly increased your credibility as a physician. Um, and <clears throat> if you had money, you could go. So there were no entrance requirements whatsoever. So that was sort of the state of things uh, for, for quite a while. Um, and some of, you know, the, the number of these programs sort of expanded and contracted and expanded, you know, it was very, very much in flux because you can imagine if you have a, a quote unquote medical school that's run by three guys, you know, one of them gets married, the other one dies, you know, then you don't have a medical school anymore. So it wasn't the most stable approach. But what happened was in uh, 1910, this fledgling organization that is now sort of a behemoth of an organization called the AAMC or the American Association for, of Medical Colleges asked this guy, Abraham Flexner, to uh, take a road trip and visit as many medical programs as he could. So he went to, you know, he went to John Hopkins, Penn, um, Harvard, Yale. So he went to all the, you know, the big East Coast, you know, older schools, but he also went across the South and, and into the Midwest, um, and even into the, onto the West Coast, um, and looked at many of these for-profit um, uh, programs. And he came back and wrote this very, very influential um, document called the Flexner Report, uh, humble guy naming it after himself. Um, and he documented how variable medical training was and how it was that you had these pr programs with no, no standards, no uh, documentation of proficiency, no entrance requirements. And he made a couple of key recommendations. First of all, he recommended that all medical education programs be affiliated with a university and not just with any old university. Let's go for a university with a big endowment. And that was his, his plan. Um, he provided a roadmap for balancing this sort of theoretical and practical tra training. And he also called for standardized assessments so that, you know, the physicians, the people that we're putting out into the, into the public as physicians all have it meet some minimal uh, level of, of competency. So I think we could all agree that this, these sound like good ideas. Um, certainly having a minimal level of competency. I certainly want my physicians to treat me and my family. I even want my veterinarian to have a minimal level of competency, right? I don't, you know, and, uh, you know, again, breaking away from the, uh, the, the European tradition of book learning, he, you know, he really endorsed this idea that, that, that practical training was just as important as the didactics. So, before we get to how this morphed into really what dominated and continues to dominate many medical schools, I just wanted to go a little bit sideways and talk about the unintended consequences. And, and that, the, the biggest unintended consequences of the Flexner report, and actually, if you go and actually read some of Flexner's writings, which I have been sucked down that rabbit hole, I'm not entirely sure they were unintended. Um, so, as the medical schools uh, became affiliated, this requirement that medical schools had to become affiliated with universities, there were only two that had the wherewithal to do that, um, that accepted African-Americans and black people. So Howard and Mahari survived, but all the other medical schools, and there were about 15 or so, that, uh, that black men, again, if you're a woman, that's a whole separate thing, but where black men could be trained. So you went from 15 to two, and it's not like the two programs that remained had the money to expand and could absorb all those extra, all those extra potential physicians or physician uh, st students. So what happened was the number of black physicians being trained decreased dramatically. The same thing happened with women. Most University affiliated programs would not accept women. They wouldn't accept Jews. Many would not accept uh, um, African-Americans or black people, black men. Um, so 
women, the ability of women and Jews to be to be educated also contracted. Now, as you know, you move forward a few years, what happened was a few of the schools put quotas in. So they would accept X number of women, they would accept X number of Jews, but many would not accept any blacks. So if you were a white man, you're good. Otherwise, you know, if you wanted to be a physician, maybe you had to have a good solid plan B. And this really had a lasting impact. So in the 48 years from 1950 to 1998, so that's 48 years, not ancient history. I have children born in the 90s. So um, about 25,000 Black and African American men were trained as physicians. Um, a little more than a quarter of those graduated from only two, these two medical schools, Mahari and, and Howard. Um, Morehouse started a medical school in 1978. So they they trained like an, a, an additional 10%. So you have basically a third of all physicians of color being trained at three schools out of a pool of over 120. Those remaining schools, if you just sort of spread it out, graduate an average of three, um, three people of color per year. But in fact, many were graduating none. So I'm getting, you know, this is very sort of American history, but. I think it's really important history. So there's a famous uh, there's a famous Supreme Court case called Plessy versus Ferguson, and it, you don't you may not be familiar with that terminology, but you're probably uh, you're probably familiar with the separate but equal terminology, and you can see what separate separate but equal. Um, you can see how equal uh, that approach is. So um, Plessy versus Ferguson was was uh, um, passed by the Supreme Court sort of during, well, at the very end of Reconstruction after the Civil War, so the late 19th century, it was overturned in 1954, but it wasn't until the early 60s when Brown versus the Board of Education uh, was uh, decided that schools of medicine could no longer deny admission to people of color. So if you don't know the story of Brown versus the Board of Education, this is Brown, uh, it's a little girl who you know, wanted to go to school with white kids. And, uh, and it, was the, uh, it was the Supreme Court decision that ended um, segregation in the US. So it wasn't until 1954 that schools had to accept blacks. And, it, and you know, during that interim period, um, separate but equal, some schools, for instance, University of Mississippi, which is a really big school, <laughs> would actually pay black men to go somewhere else. And that's how they got around it. So it was because that was their separate but equal. You can't come here, but we'll, we'll give you a scholarship and you can, you can go to Mahari. So it's pretty shameful. Okay, now getting back to the impact um, on medical education um, as a model um, of the Flexner report. So, the two plus two model was born around, you know, shortly after Flexner and is still, you can still, it is, you don't have to look hard, at least in the United States and Canada to find it here, uh, it, it still exists. And the two plus two model was two years of didactics or lectures and two years of apprenticeship or clerkship training. So, and to get even more granular, it was, Year one was normal anatomy and physiology. So you learned basically all the body systems, you learned biochemistry, you learned microbiology, but nothing about, you know, nothing about disease. Year two, you went back and retreaded all that stuff, but in terms of disease. And then in years three and four, you started your clerkships or your, you started on the floors. Now the NBME, which is the National Board of Medical Examiners began licensure testing in uh, 1915, so that's five years after the release of the of the Flexner um, report. And by uh, the end of World War II, most states were using this service. So before then, um, if there was a licensure exam, it was state run. It became national um, by the end of World War II. And then, um, you know, this is sort of in the weeds. But if you're planning on, or if you know someone in a U.S. medical school, um, you know, they they quiver at the thought of the USMLE step, step exams. Those were actually, uh, USMLE replaced the 
the NBME in terms of providing these exams in 1992. Um, so, so the point being that we had this two plus two model and we had these standardized exams, um, one given at the end of the first two years, one given towards the end of the third beginning of the fourth year. So like I said, many of these, uh, many schools still, uh, uh, still follow this sort of to the letter, um, but many medical schools, I'm gonna now shift gears into what's happening now in, in medical education, started asking some questions like, um, should the line between uh, pre-clerkship, so sh should we wait a whole two years before students have exposure to patients? Or should we start exposing student, uh, our, our medical students to patients earlier on so that they get some authentic experience with patients? Uh, very early as they're learning this material. Um, a key question is, you know, are lectures really the best way to learn? And I, I could go off on a whole nother tangent about that. Um, should normal and abnormal physiology be taught together comparatively, or do we really want to segregate it one year of one and one year of the other? Um, and then something that nobody ever asked before, which is how do we support students as they develop their professional identities? Because when you start medical school, I will assure you, you feel very much like you did when you were a senior in your undergraduate years. Um, by the time you graduate from medical school, you have a professional identity. You view your, your whole identity as wrapped around being a physician. And so that is a journey um, that some students just sort of take to like ducks to water and other students have more trouble developing. And how do we help all students really become the best physicians in terms of main, you know, everything that that professional identity entails. So you can sort of think of US medical education um, and, and in Europe as well, although the model is somewhat different in that we have four years of undergraduate college plus four years of, of, of what we call undergraduate medical education and then, and then um, graduate medical education is when you're a, a, a resident. So, in Europe, it's typically six, a six-year combined program before you do your residency. Um, nonetheless, it's some you can still track them in these three buckets I'm going to present. So the first bucket is these traditional programs, super lecture heavy. Uh, some programs, you know, you go to you literally go to school from eight in the morning till five in the afternoon. Some of them have, you know morph where you can watch it online, you know, but still it's very lecture heavy. There's very little, if any, clinical experience until the third year. Uh, then there's revised programs. So these are the, the, the older schools who, who had this two plus two model and said, you know what, um, we, wanna, we wanna change this a little bit uh, and we wanna start mixing different types of, of, of um, learning activities. So not just lecture, we'll do some small groups. So this is called team-based learning. It's very big in many medical schools where uh, students are in individual teams. There is a single or one or two uh, professors running the show, but it's very sort of, um, the students are very actively engaged. Um, there's a trend towards shortening that first two years to make it, you know, maybe only 18 months and um, there's some exposure to clinical experience early. And then there's a whole bunch of new medical schools have started since 2000, since the turn of the 21st century. And because new medical schools didn't have to, you know, the, you can think of all the different analogies, you know, turning an aircraft carrier or what, you know, that kind of thing, didn't have to like go to their faculty and say, we're gonna try this new thing and have to listen to their faculty say, but we've always done it this way, why would we change? Um, new medical schools don't have that kind of history. So they are much more free, freer to innovate. And so they've gone to block courses, case-based and problem-based learning. So you can see if you compare this, which is a room full of students actively engaging in team-based learning, but there's only one professor to small group learning where here's, here's a professor and here's all the students engaging in, 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 a, in, in a learning activity. So um, is this, can I just, maybe I, should I break and take some questions now or should I just launch into 
So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about the school where I work because that's what I know the most about. And I can sort of give you guys an idea of what a new medical school looks like, some of the things that we do. Um, but are there any questions at this point? I feel like I've been yapping for a really long time. Any questions? So I just okay, keep so going. This one question in the chat and it asks if the system is different for BSMD programs. So um, I can talk about BS, BSMD programs. There's a couple of different types of BSMD programs. So I actually oversee the BSMD program at the Zucker School of Medicine where I work. Many of the BSMD, so they're in the US, the BSMD programs are often described by how many years of undergraduate versus plus the four years of medical school. So you have three plus four and you have four plus four. So those are the two kind of flavors. So if you're looking at BSMD programs, the first thing you wanna know is, is it a three plus four or a four plus four? A four plus four program is four years of undergraduate, four years of medical school. A three plus four program is a three year of undergraduate, four years of medical school. The three plus four programs tend to be very prescriptive in terms of what you can do uh, during your undergraduate years. They basically say, okay, year one, you're gonna take this, year two, you're gonna take these courses, year three, you're gonna take these courses, and then you get, you know, and then, and then, you know, you may or may not have to take the MCAT. You typically, they all have a GPA requirement. So you have to hit the certain GPA. Some of them will require that you do community service or some other kinds of, you know, research community service or shadowing of, of physicians. Some of them have no, uh, no um, requirements like that. So you really want to sort of understand what are the, what are the requirements and, and how much freedom do I have as an undergraduate? So the three plus four have very little freedom. The four plus four um, have, you have this extra year, depending on the school, they're not, first of all, they're rarer. They're not, they're not that many four plus four programs. Speaking about our own, we really want students, the reason it's a four plus four program is we really want students to have a normal undergraduate experience. We want them to do all the things that undergraduates do. So we want them to be on clubs. We want them to play sports if that's their thing. We want them to be on in the orchestra or take violin lessons or whatever it is that they, they wanna do. Do global medicine, do a year abroad. Um, whatever it is that you know rocks their boat, we want them to do that kind of exploration. And more importantly, we want them to, to mature and grow up a little bit. Um, our program has an MCAT requirement. And you have to hit a certain number for an MCAT and you have a GPA requirement. Um, everything else is sort of up to you as the student. Um, I would say that the attrition rate in the three plus four programs is about 50%. Um, the attrition rate, I can only speak for my program. So in our program, we have a very, very low attrition rate. In fact, most we, we very rarely lose a student uh, because they want to do something, they decide they want to go do something else. The students we usually leave that leave are students who don't make the GPA cut or they don't make the MCAT cut. So if you're looking at, so my advice is if you're looking at BSMD programs, First of all, look at that. You think about what, what do I want? Do I want to be super focused and just take the courses I need to be a physician or do I want some latitude so that I can explore other things as well? That will, deter, that will sort of point you in the direction of three plus four or four plus four. So, and the, the other thing I say to my students who are in the four plus four, when we meet during orientation, I just had these meetings last week actually, as I point out to them that they're in a pressure cooker because when you go to college, obviously as a freshman, it's maybe the first time you're away from home for a considerable period of time, you have to, you know, this is the first time you're taking college courses, you have to get used to living with a roommate, you have to sort of get used to the whole college life. And yet your GPA when you start out is zero, right? Because you're starting with a clean slate and you are under this pressure to get to keep your GPA, in our case, the GPA can't slip below a 3.6. Um, so um, the students are under a lot of pressure in those first few semesters to really perform. Um, so you just you really need to think about um, you know, how well you do under pressure. If you thrive under pressure, 
then a BSND program is going to be good for you. If you are the type of person who just gets too, you know, um, you get too wrangled up, you just get a little bit too uh, anxious being under pressure, I, I wouldn't suggest a, a BSND program. So it's probably more than you wanted to know about BSND programs. We good? Um, another, yeah, another yeah. question in I the can't chat. see the chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. So do you have any advice on how to choose your medical school program? Yeah, so, so um, let me go through this piece because I'm gonna talk about medical school programs and, and then we can have a really great discussion about, about that. Cause it's sort of like my last slide is like, yeah, if you're gonna think about medical school, let's think about what you, you know, what you want. So is that, is that okay? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, all right, off we go. So, um, so if we think back to, um, to what happened after Flexner, um, you know, and now we look at medical schools. I'm going to actually frame this in like, you know, if you're sh shopping for a medical school, um, something that very few students do, but what I really encourage you to do is to look at the medical school's mission statement and to look at their values and ask yourself, does this speak to me? Do, so, so our mission statement happens to talk about community and innovation and diversity. Um, do those, are those things important to you? The mission statement are, is like the big headline, like this is what we frame everything we do. Um, look at the values, do they, do they speak to you? Are they really research heavy, for instance, or are they really um, patient care heavy? So, so think about what's important to you as an individual, your core set of values. Look at the mission statement and the values of the medical schools you're applying to and ask yourself, does this align with how I feel? Um, okay, so we have block courses. So this is another thing. Ask yourself, do I learn best? How do I learn best? Do I learn best in lectures? Do I learn best doing things on my own? Do I, learn, do I like to work in teams and in groups? I hope so, because if you're gonna be a physician, you need to, you know, you really need to, you, you need to be able to work on a team. Um, and ask you, so if you're somebody who really, you know, prefers to sit in a lecture room, in a lecture hall and have, facts and figures and everything sort of given to you that you can then cogitate on and then sort of make sense on your own, then you wanna look at a school that's more traditional. Um, if you are the type of person who really likes to work in small groups, who really likes to uh, maybe teach your peers or to follow your own curiosity, then look at a more non-traditional school. Our school's very non-traditional. Um, we don't even call it years one and two, we call it the first 100 weeks and each, and students take one course at a time. And each course is broken into what we call different components. So we have the basic science component, the anatomy component, the, the sort of doctoring skills component, I'll talk about that. But you can see, so what, what happens is the students come in in August and they take a sort of overview course. Um, they actually become uh, develop, they actually get certified as New York State EMTs, um, emergency medical technicians, and that enables them to have authentic clinical experiences in ambulatory settings, so in outpatient clinics, through their uh, first 100 weeks. They then march through the, uh, the courses, and our courses happen to be, again, we're very non-traditional. Most schools have the courses arranged in, in organ systems. Um, if they're not doing the, the, the traditional two plus two. Um, we have it built, we're building a human. So we're starting with cells and molecules. Then we get to organs. Then we get to how does this person interact with the environment? So we look at infectious disease, uh, immunology, and then what makes us uniquely human? And that's the nervous, the nervous system, psychiatry, brain and behavior. So. Uh, I talked about the curricular components. So, so we, our basic science component, we have, um, so about 80% of our learning is done in small groups. We do have large group sessions, but the large group sessions are, are very um, 
interactive. Uh, we, even though you're in a large group, you may be breaking out into small groups. Um, this is one of our master educators um, and he will keep you on your toes. Um, he's like, he, he's pretty amazing. He can teach an hour and a half of pathology with five slides and keep you absolutely wrapped. Um, and uh, we have uh, the sort of centerpiece of our basic science is uh, a, a um, program we call Pearls. So six hours a week, you're in these small groups where you're responsible for learning. It's case-based, but you take a case and you ask yourself, what do I need to learn to understand this case? And you come back and you teach it to your peers. It's very, very interactive. A lot of, we have walls that you can write on. Um, so it's very, uh, it's a very dynamic setting. Um, rather than a single anatomy course, we have a, the first 100 weeks has a component that goes the entire time. So every once a week for five hours a week, you are uh, doing either physical diagnosis or anatomy. Um, and we teach in stations. So rather than doing the classical head to toe dissection in the first 12 weeks of medical school, you are, if you're learning about cardiac physiology in the basic science component, you're learning about um, cardiac anatomy, cardiac embryology, medical imaging of cardia uh, of, of the heart, so on and so forth in our, in our, um, in our structure uh, component. And then of course we have to teach you how to be doctors. So we have a component called patient physician and society and most medical schools have a course like this. It's, ca it's called something like doctoring skills or something, something along these lines. And so it includes physical diagnosis um, and, you know, uh, the components like bioethics, clinical epidemiology, uh, so on and so forth. Um, we actually have students, as I mentioned, going into ambulatory um, settings from, you know, essentially the very first course. So our students are gaining some clinical skills and they're also gaining the capacity to speak and interview patients, which is, which is really, really important. I think that's the skill they actually learn the most um, over that first one. 100 weeks. So, so think about, so think about what kind of learner you are. Um, do I want to be in small groups most of the time? Am I the type of person who wants to just blend in and sit in a large lecture hall? Um, that's going to, to, to really steer you in one direction or the other. Um, the third and the fourth years um, are, look pretty, can look pretty similar from school to school. Um, it's when you rotate through what are called core clerkships. So if you think about medicine as a whole, there's you know a gazillion specialties and subspecialties. The core clerkships are sort of the, the main event, like you need to get experience in neurology, psychiatry, OBGYN, pediatrics, medicine, and surgery. We also have uh, these uh, two week periods where students can rotate through whatever they want to rotate through, so sort of career exploration. Now the trend in the United States for the fourth year, there is no trend actually, I should say. The fourth year is sort of a, this is another place when you're shopping for medical schools, you know, you want to look at that first two years, what does that look like? The fourth year or the third, fourth year you're going to find a lot of different models. So some schools will have a research requirement where you take a year and do research. If that doesn't appeal to you, don't apply. Some schools have a required service element, in other words, community service. Some schools actually have gotten rid of the, the, the fourth year. These are schools that uh, put you right in a residency in their program. So. Um, so for instance, uh, there's a, not, NYU, not NYU in the city, but NYU um, on Long Island has a three-year program and the fourth year they put you at, in a residency in, at, at NYU. The caveat is it has to be in primary care. So if you're planning, so the, my, my sense is, my problem with this is I cannot tell you how many students I've met in the first 100 weeks who, who would you know, bet the farm, they would bet their mother's life that they want to become, I don't know, uh, pediatric psychiatrists. I want to become a OBGYN. And then they go through the clerkships and they come out the other end and they say, holy cow, I just absolutely fell in love with XYZ. 
So, so even if you're sure, hundred percent sure you, you, this is what you want to do with your life. Just knock that down to 99% because people do change their minds. So that's my problem with the three-year programs. Yeah, you save money for sure because you're only paying for three years of medical school rather than four years, but you kind of lock yourself into going into primary care. Now, depending on the school, they can define primary care differently. So the NYU program I'm thinking of actually def defines general surgery as primary care, which is a little bit of a stretch, but I think they had to do that in order to get the recruit the class they wanted. So it's usually internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, and in their case, general surgery. Um, I don't know, I think this is, you know, if you're shopping for a medical school, think about what fits your model best and your learning needs and, you know, the other stuff I don't need to go over. Um, so I think I'm just going to end there and let's, let's have a discussion. I'm going to stop sharing if that's okay. And put us into Brady Bunch mode. There we go. And now I can see the chat. Great. Okay. Um, BSMD, do you have any advice? How you? Okay. How different are nursing programs to the physician programs? So nursing programs, um, so there are different, so if you are leaving high school and planning on becoming a nurse, um, then you would go into, in, so I, again, I can only talk about the US system. You would go into a bachelor of science for nursing program. The nursing programs are, are very different in that it's four, you're four years and then you're done. It's not, it's, you know, you're done at the end of, at the BS level. Um, you don't have to take nearly as much uh, science. So you take one semester of chemistry. Compare that with our, our BSMD students have to take five semesters of chemistry. So you take one semester of chemistry. Um, you get into the sort of nursing skill programs um, pretty early. Uh, depending on the on the program, it could be as early as the first semester. Some programs wait. Again, they have a sort of shrunken two plus two model where they they you know you wait until you're a, a third year or sophomore student. So again, you want to look at there there. Are, I don't know that much about nursing programs anymore, but um, I think you want to really take a look again at you know what are the values? What's the mission statement? What does, what does the sequence look like? Um, when, how early do you have clinical exposure? Um, what are your, what are the expectations for, for doing well in the program? So I don't know if, does that, I don't know who asked, so this was um, Setsrel, does that answer your question? No, no, that was not, it was Angie. Angie, does that answer your question? I don't see you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Who else do we have here? Um, I want to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist in the future, but I'm not sure if I want to study medicine to me doing graduate degree in clinical. Yeah. So, okay. So, so the short answer is, do you want to be able to prescribe drugs? Um, psychologists in the, in the U.S. have a limited ability. They typically work with a, psych a psychiatrist so they can call up a psychiatrist and say, I have this patient and I think he's bipolar and um, you know, can we talk about what drugs to prescribe? So, so as a psychologist, uh, you can't prescribe drugs and that's because you haven't gone to medical school. So many of the psychiatric drugs um, have drug-drug interactions. So it's being a psychiatrist you really, you really, really, really have to know your, your drugs and what they, you know, you have to have a lot of sort of uh, um, uh, detailed knowledge of the, 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 the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the, of the different drugs. Um, if you want to do research, um, if you want to do clinical research, I should say, it's much easier if you're a psychiatrist than you're a psychologist. If you want to go into private practice and literally help people through talk therapy, uh, through, uh, you know, then, then definitely um, psychology is the, is the way to go. So a clinical, in the U.S. to become a clinical psychologist, you would major in psychology, psych, psychology as an undergraduate. 
um, or related, you know, you could do sociology or related, you could even you just do biology and a minor in psychology, um, cognitive science, neuroscience, something along those lines. That's what you would major in. And then you would go to a, a graduate degree in clinical psychology. And these clinical psychology degrees um, are different than other kinds of PhDs. They're, they're more sort of, um, you know, in a, in a traditional research, you know, science PhD, you know, you take a couple years of courses and then you, you're set loose in the lab and you got to finish your thesis and write it up and defend it. And, you know, you should be done in five years, but some students, you know, for whatever reason, take, take longer. Um, the PhD in clinical psychiatry, psychology is usually much more constrained and they really, they get you out in three to four years. Um, in your opinion, are private universities better than public? No. Um, okay, so here's, so Angie, good question. So community college as an undergraduate. So I hate to have to say this, but if you go to two years of community college and then transfer to another, you know, to a four-year school, you may have more trouble getting into medical school than somebody who went to a regular four years, went to four years either in a private or public. Um, community college, because it takes all comers, um, the belief, whether it's legit or not, the belief is that it's way easier to get a good GPA, to get an A. If I take calculus at a community college, calculus, like, you know, you either get the right answer and show your work or you don't. You know how that works, right, guys? It's super objective. Yeah. Yet, there is this belief that if you go to community college and get straight A's, that's way easier than if you go to a regular university where the competition may be a little stiffer. So keep that in mind. Certainly, if it's what you can afford and it makes the most sense for you financially or geographically or for whatever reason, do it. I would just say that you want to then supplement your um, resume by doing lots of community service or research project or, or something. You want to, you know, you want to sort of have a lot of, you know, punch a lot of a lot of those other boxes. You want to really uh, shine in those other ways. Private versus public. You know, some people get really excited. So I'm going to tell you, I'm a product of University of Pennsylvania. MIT and Harvard. Okay, so yeah, you know, and nothing makes me crazier when people get seduced by that and think that just because somebody went to these, whatever, fancy East Coast schools, that they're somehow better than everybody else. It makes me want to freaking scream. So that's my personal bias. There are people in this world, however, who really do. They look at that kind of pedigree and say, oh, you know, that's amazing, blah, blah, blah. I think you go what feels best to you where you're going to have the best success because at the end of the day, it depends on your grades. You know, it depends on and, and how well you do those grades will depend on how happy you are. So it doesn't make any sense to go someplace like Hopkins and be miserable and wind up with a, you know, a 3.2 GPA when you could have gone to the University of Maryland instead where your friends went or where, you know, they have this particular program that you're super, super interested in, you're happy as a clam and you wind up with a 3.7 GPA. So it's, it's yeah, it's messy. Uh, somebody who wants to be a dermatologist. Okay, this is what I recommend. You shadow a dermatologist and you find a dermatologist to do research with. Dermatology is tough. Everybody wants to be a dermatologist. Um, so that's a very short, but I'm not being snarky. You really, you know, as early as you can, you want to sort of, pat, you know, find a dermatologist that will let you shadow in their office. And uh, either while you're an undergraduate or, you know, early in your medical school career, find uh, a opportunity to do some derm research. What is the most earning specialty? <laughs> So you can go online and find this out, but the highest paid are typically neurosurgery uh, and orthopedic surgery. Um, those are uh, those are really uh, dermatologists don't do too shabby either. 
Um, do you have, yes, you have to be a, re you have to do a residency. You don't have to, but if you wanna practice as a physician, you have to do a residency. So if you get your medical degree and don't do a residency, you don't take your last, you cannot take your last step exam. So you won't be fully accredited. Now, if you decide to do your medical degree and go off and do research for the rest of your life and you're never gonna wanna do clinical research, that's fine. You know, you don't need to do a residency, but you're really sort of, you're slamming Dora shut, slamming a Dora shut if you don't do a residency. Can someone with average grades enter pre-med? Pre-med, sure. Um, I think that people bloom at different points in their lives. Um, personally, I hated high school. I did okay in high school. I mean, I got into Penn because I did really well in the standardized tests. Believe me, it wasn't because of my grades. Um, so, um, you know, just because you didn't do well in high school doesn't mean that you're not going to do well in college. Um, as I had, so one of my kids really had a tough time in high school. And I, you know, as I told him, I said, look, the only thing you have in common with these kids is geography. Like, that's it. And he, he went to an engineering school and totally blossomed. So sure, you can try pre-med, um, you know, if you were an average student in high school and just see how it goes. If it doesn't go particularly well, then you, you know, reassess and do something else. You guys are so young. You have, okay. Uh, would you recommend doing, oh, of course, I would recommend doing microbiology as an undergrad or immunology. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a microbiologist. Why would I say no? Um, yes, absolutely. These are super relevant. Um, wait a minute. I think I missed somebody. Can someone with average, no, wait, uh, oh, hang on. Can someone with average gauge recommend doing microbiology? I'm interested in ophthalm ophthalmology. Do you have any tips for how I can learn about, whoop, about the field in high school? Reach out to an ophthalmologist. There are a lot of really nice people in the world. Don't be shy. Reach out. I mean, I didn't know Josh, and she just shot me an email, right? You know? So reach out to an ophthalmologist, reach out to more than one ophthalmologist and say, I'm a high school student, I'm really super interested in ophthalmology. Would you mind if I came and shadowed? You know, P.S. I'm vaccinated, hopefully. Um, what do I think is the best pre-med major? There is no such thing as the best pre-med major. It's what you are passionate about, what you like the most. I sit on the admissions committee. We, you know, I mean, these are scary numbers. We get about 6,000 applicants for 100 spots. So that's horrifying. But what I want to emphasize is that, you know, when you're dealing with that volume of applicants, I certainly don't read all 6,000 applications, but you know, you start, you start seeing a lot of students who really look alike. So what you want to do is something that's going to set you apart from all the other biochem and biology majors, you know, so, so minor in something, you know, philosophy or or, you know, women's studies or, or I don't know, whatever you, you know, whatever you really are passionate about, you know, if you want to be a mate or, or just be, a, you know, you got to do the prereqs, right? You got, so my advice is don't do what all the other pre-meds are doing because then you're just going to look just like them when you apply. So the other thing is with the, like the community service, like your extracurriculars, it's so much better to do a limited number that you're super excited about, that you do for a longer period of time. Nothing makes me crazier when I look at these applications and I see people, oh, I did uh, served at a soup, ki soup kitchen 12 hours, I, you know, like total in my whole life. Um, oh, I did, you know, Habitat for ha Humanity. 16 hours. It's like, stop. It's like, don't be the little butterfly that's going around and sort of alighting from flower to flower to flower. Be like, you know, that serious person who says, I am really concerned about, about people who are unhoused. I'm going to go do Habitat for Humanity. I'm going to raise money for them. I'm going to build with them. I'm going to do blah, blah, blah. That way, also, when you get into your interview, it gives you a really great um, topic for conversation that you can really dig into and discuss. I don't know, is any um, of this helpful? 
Yes. No? Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay, should I keep going um, or are you tired? What time is it? Because we're past on. time. Yeah, uh, we so have our next speaker on. But thank okay. you so much. Those are wonderful. Sure. Like you did, your answers were really nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, all right. Well, good luck. And I'm sorry I went over. You guys needed to like, you know, shut me up. So, okay. Well, take care and uh, good luck to everybody. Thank you.